the Netherlands for a postdoc and then to Germany, to Erlangen, Nuremberg for a postdoc and got involved in kind of KM3Net or Antares there. And now since 2017, he is at Curtin University um, and is working also on fast radio burst, he told me. But today he will be telling us about KM3Net and how to study atmospheric and ast astrophysical neutrinos in the Mediterranean. All right, well, thank you very much, um, Michael. I'll um, get going. I, thank you very much also for uh, allowing me to present here. So I'm not really sure of the backgrounds of um, the entire audience. So I'm going to start out with some basic neutrino physics here. But if this is all going to be completely boring for absolutely anyone, I don't know how many students are in attendance, please feel free to yell at me uh, when I start reminding people of neutrino oscillations. And I'm also going to assume that you can interrupt at any time. Um, so feel free to ask a question. But with that, let's continue. So let's begin with some basic neutrino physics. So there's a lot of neutrino physics, right? And a lot of it depends on the energy scale. So you can really begin with, you know, some kind of relic neutrinos from the Big Bang down at a tiny fraction of an electron volt, right up to perhaps cosmogenic neutrinos from the ultra high energy cosmic, cosmic ray interactions with the CMB. And, you know, you get um, solar neutrinos in the sort of MEV range, um, low energy terrestrial neutrinos from radioactive decays. Um, but the regimes I'll be talking about here, there's essentially three, although the difference between the two high energy regimes is a bit iffy, right? So this is going to be the sort of normally one to 100 GV range. And this is where we'll be talking about the neutrino mass hierarchy and studying um, atmospheric neutrino oscillations over Earth baselines. And that's sort of one classification of interesting physics. Another, how to look at neutrinos in sort of the 100 GeV to 100 TeV range, which is what you'd sort of expect from galactic cosmic ray accelerators. Very hand wavy uh, boundaries of energy here. And then the next energy range is sort of 100 TeV to 10 PeV, where you might normally say, okay, this is where we're going to start looking for extra galactic sources um, of neutrinos, right, at higher energies because we know that the highest energy cosmic rays must come from some extra galactic source. And so, of course, you know, as you go up in energy, you change the physics you're interested in, you increase your cross-section. This is for, if I remember, um, I forget which flavor, of new, it must be anti new e scattering on electrons, but you also massively decrease your flux, right? Um, and so, the, you know, the kind of experiment you design and the size of the experiment depends a lot on the scale. So one of the original motivations for looking um, at astrophysical neutrinos come from this multi-messenger paradigm, right? We know we see cosmic rays. We know the universe is full of protons and photons, and these can interact to produce um, cosmic ray protons and neutrons, a bunch of pions. The pions will then decay to give you muons, muon neutrinos. Muons decay to give you electrons, electron neutrinos. Neutrons decay to also give you neutrinos. And so we see cosmic rays, we expect neutrinos. So that's the main motivation. The pi noughts decay to gamma rays and the electrons from these processes will emit synchrotron in first Compton Bramstrom, right? And so typically you find that experiments studying the cosmic rays themselves, neutrino experiments and TV um, and uh, gamma ray experiments um, are all probing sort of high energy um, hadronic accelerators. So this is all sort of quite closely interlinked. So let's uh, jump to not KM3Net, but the currently uh, largest neutrino observatory in the world, which is IceCube. So this is located smack bang at the South Pole um, at Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. It's, as its name suggests, a kilometer cubed of ice buried at a depth of between about one and a half and two and a half kilometers at the South Pole. And it consists of a total of about 5,000 optical modules um, that are buried down these holes that are then filled with water and refrozen, right? So you're not getting them back out again. So it's a huge detector, right? Like I said, one kilometer cubed of implemented volume. There's some infills as well, which I won't talk about. So this has been looking for neutrinos uh, for about the last 10 years, depending on when you say it began, because it was a built-in stages. Um, and this thing has discovered an astrophysical flux of neutrinos, right? So this began back um, in, with events observed near the end of 2011, 2012. They were named after 
the Mupp uh, yes, the Muppets, Bert and Ernie, right? Or Sesame Street characters. Um, so here's Bert and this is Ernie. And these were events with a deposited energy in the detector of about a petra electron volt, right? I'll talk more a little bit later about the, um, the detection method, but this is the optical, the magnitude indicates the optical signature in the detector and the color code blue is later and red is earlier. Okay. So follow-up observations then confirmed that there was an astrophysical flux. And this diagram here gives an approximate state of current knowledge, right? So what we have here in the different color codes are the different sources of neutrinos, right? The red is the astrophysical, you know, the modeled astrophysical flux. The gray is a sum of all the different Monte Carlo contributions, including the astrophysical flux. We have a contribution from atmospheric muons, which are misreconstructed, right? In theory, you don't want to include any atmospheric muons in your detection, but you get some by accident. You have standard um, atmospheric neutrino fluxes, right, from pion and kaon decay. And you also have a um, flux of prompt uh, neutrinos from the decay of, say, charm mesons like D and so on. Although there's only an upper limit on this contribution. And you have the data. And you see that clearly, if this is the sum of all the atmospheric contributions, this is the data that you observe, there's a clear excess, right? So there's definitely some astrophysical neutrino flux that's being observed by IceCube. And one thing I will say is that at different times, IceCube and Antares and KM3Net haven't gotten along, you know, clear rivals, two groups, American versus, Euro mostly American versus mostly European. And, um, you know, at the Antarctic versus the Mediterranean. But, um, even my worst moments of complaining about IceCube, KM3Net would not exist at all if it hadn't been for this fantastic discovery by IceCube, right? Um, it's one thing to build a detector to study um, neutrinos with precision, but if the neutrinos aren't there, no one's gonna fund you to do that. So I'm gonna make this 100% clear um, in case anyone from IceCube is here. Thank you very much. Um, the detect KM3Net would not exist without this project. Okay, so where are these neutrinos coming from? Well, the simplest thing you can do is sort of do a time integrated search for an excess of neutrinos in the sky, right? You look for an excess in direction and you see, is there a clustering about different points? And the main thing that I wanna get from this uh, slide is two points. One, there's been no excess found in any time integrated search by IceCube, right? Where you simply look in some direction, are there more neutrinos coming from there? Well, you're looking over a huge amount of sky, so you'll see, you know, some excesses, but it's all 100% consistent with background random fluctuations. Um, and that also fails when you say, oh, what about blazars? What about star-forming galaxies, right? You can do stack searches. You get, you know, two-ish sigma results, but there's been no result that's found something significant from pure time integrated searches. The other point I wanted to get from this slide is here we have the sensitivity. This is to an e to the minus two spectrum. This is to an e to the minus three spectrum. It looks more sensitive to e to the minus three because it's normalized um, at one TeV, right? The typical sensitivity for ice cube begins closer to 10 or 100 TeV. So if you normalize your flux at one TeV, then you appear more sensitive um, with a steeper spectrum. Even though in fact, you're probably less sensitive. And you see here that ice cube is mostly sensitive to the northern hemisphere. Um, and that's simply because you use the earth as a shield against your atmospheric backgrounds, right? And so ice cube is less sensitive to the southern hemisphere sources. So straight away, we see that if there was an Antarctica in the northern hemisphere, and there is not, and what Antarctica there is, is getting smaller by the day um, in the Greenland ice sheet, um, there's a clear motivation for building an identical experiment in the northern hemisphere to fill in the sensitivity gap. All right, what IceCube did discover though, was this thing. So IceCube had a single high energy event, which is this one here, it's a through going track event. So this is consistent with a very high energy muon, although technically it could be an even higher energy tau, um, passing through the detector. This event was of such high energy that it's very unlikely to be of atmospheric origin. And if you trace back where this thing came from, here's your ice cube error bar. And here is a uh, magic significance map, so in TV gamma rays. 
we see a blazer here, TXS 0506 plus 056, right? And so this is, you know, interesting, right? There's the significance of this association is 3.5 sigma. Um, and so, so, well, it looks like this neutrino came from that blazer, but 3.5 sigma isn't quite enough for a discovery. Um, and at most of all the different high energy events that Ice Cube has seen like this, and there's been, you know, about 50 or so, at most one other event can be associated with a blazer. So it's telling you right off the bat that this does not simply say all high energy neutrinos come from blazers, or at least if they do, it's something more complicated that is happening than we can understand easily. However, what makes this quite plausible, oh, actually, sorry, what makes it plausible is the next slide. Um, the other thing that was noted is that when this occurred, the Fermi collaboration said, hey, this blazer is in a flaring state. So here we have a typical blazer SED. Um, we have uh, radio observations down here, optical UV, X-rays, Fermi gamma rays, TV uh, gamma rays, and the observed neutrino energy here. And this is, you know, E squared times the flux, right? So this is um, equal. So this is sort of equal energy uh, in this plot. And you see the gray, and the gray points are historical observations. So you can sort of trace this approximate SED out. However, the colored points are observations at the time of this uh, high energy neutrino, or within about two weeks of it. And you see in the high energy regime, you get an exit, you know, you get about 10 times the normal activity, right? Or five or six times the normal activity. So at first you say, hey, great, this thing was flaring. Uh, there's some flaring going on that's interesting. Ice Cube then did a look back observation. Now that I said, well, this blazer is apparently interesting. What happens if we go back in time and look to see if anything interesting was happening in the past? Now, if you just do a time integrated search, you only get something like a two sigma significance. However, there's this excess of events um, near the end of 2014, early 2015, and not just an excess in number, an excess of higher energy events, right? So the color coding is purple as higher energy, which means more likely to be astrophysical. Um, and so you see this thing, which has been called a neutrino flare. Now exactly the shape of the flare and when it does and does not begin is a bit ambiguous, but um, you do see evidence for an excess here. And again, this is about 3.5 sigma. So you've got a couple of 3.5 sigmas um, and this is pretty strong, not 100% conclusive, but pretty strong evidence that this is the first astrophysical source of high energy neutrinos and second overall, or actually it should be third overall um, for all neutrinos after supernova 1987A. I was forgetting about the sun, but sun's boring. Sorry, sun. Okay, so that's the sort of status from Ice Cube. However, there's plenty of remaining questions. This is one blazer, right? So you can ask, well, how did this particular blazer produce its neutrinos? And I'll get back to this later, but it's fairly unclear exactly how this production came about. You can also ask why not other blazers? There's a lot of blazers in the sky. Why this one? And this particular one was not on anybody's mo two monitor list, right? It was something like the 50th gamma ray bright blazer in the sky. And then you can also ask, well, what other sources are there? Because when you do a blazer stacking analysis, you sort of limit the total blazer contribution to be at most 20% of the diffuse ice cube astrophysical flux, right? So it motivates, there should be other sources. But this is all extragalactic work. You can also ask, well, what about stuff in our galaxy, right? We see cosmic rays. Um, and so there must be something in our galaxy that accelerates um, cosmic rays to at least, at least pevatron, petroelectron volts at the moment. We call these things pevatrons. So various high energy experiments, Hess, Fermi, Hawke, Right, they found evidence for galactic sources, right? You get things like the um, pevatron in the center of the, you know, near the galactic center that was sort of identified by Hess. Young supernova remnants like Rx, J1713 here. The problem is that essentially any photon signal is going to be at, to some degree ambiguous, right? You can always reproduce it leptonically. And the arguments for these things being hadronic accelerators versus leptonic tend to be around how many parameters you need to describe the, um, the hadronic model versus do you need very many more parameters? For instance, multiple spectral breaks in a leptonic model. Um, is it described by one source or a distribution, right? So I'm not trying to say that these things aren't hadronic accelerators, but to really 
convince yourself that they are, you would like to see a neutrino excess from them. All right, so that's one class of physics. Let's take a step back and go to much lower energies. Well, okay, technically it happens at all energies, but we're now gonna be going to the lower energy regime where you're interested in neutrino mixing. So just for um, a refresher or to bore the heck out of those of you who do this for your profession, right? Neutrino mixing is where you have different mass eigenstates compared to the flavor states. And each flavor state is mixed, uh, is a mixture of the mass eigenstates. And that mixing is governed by the PM and S matrix, right? Uh, U here. So it's got four parameters. It's got mixing angles between uh, theta two, three, one, three, and one, two between the three different combinations of states. And you can ha also have a phase here, which is your uh, CP violating phase, right? So you've got four free parameters in this model. Plus, of course, you've got the absolute masses of each of the, um, of each of the neutrino mass states, right? So in general, that's a total of seven parameters to describe this behavior, given we clearly identify the flavor states. Now, as a neutrino, you know, as a massive particle propagates, Right, you start out with this initial state, here's your final state, and you simply have a, a plane wave solution, right? E to the minus i, E i t minus p i dot x, right? And in the limit where you have a much higher energy than your mass, this expression here reduces to this one. And what this tells you is that after propagating, the phase of this state with respect to this one depends on the mass squared, the length over which you propagated and the energy of the particle. Now, what this means is that if you start out with an, with, um, an admixture of these mass states and they have different masses, then you're going to get a phase difference between these mass states as you travel along. And that's going to depend on Le and the difference delta M squared. And then when you measure your flavor state after some length L, you can measure a different state because now you have a different mixture of these. So here's one particular example of oscillation probabilities, right? L on, he, L on E here, km kilometers per GeV. And I'll say right now, Wikipedia, Wikipedia Commons has a beautiful um, explanation of neutrino mixing. So go there, you get lovely simple figures. Um, I'm gonna swallow my pride and go for simplicity of uh, getting results rather than going ahead and trying to reproduce them myself just to prove that I can. So here we have an uh, electron neutrino that starts out, that's definitely electron neutrino. Then you have two different characteristic scales of mixing, right? Governed by the two major mass differences where you get one scale of oscillations, which is fairly rapid and a broader scale, which is slower. And here I should know which flavor state is represented by blue and red. Um, whether or not this is muon and tau is my guess, but I uh, forget exactly which, right? But you see, as you progress, you change flavor states. Now, this oscillation depends on, in a vacuum, depends only on the squared mass differences, right? So this squared minus another uh, flavor, uh, mass state squared. So in a vacuum, there is no way to tell the absolute values. However, when you're in a medium, right, your neutrinos see a different um, effective potential and hence effective mass, right? Because they then can interact with the, primarily with the electrons in the medium to give you this sort of forward scattering. Here's one particular uh, diagram for that effect with an electron neutrino. And this means that you have an effect of uh, change in your mass, right? If you, um, and in given that effect of change in mass, your, this changes your delta M squared in a way that's dependent upon the order, right? As which, flight, which mass state is heavier and which is lighter. Now, this has already been resolved for solar neutrino oscillations, right? Where your mass two state is definitively heavier than your mass one state, right? So your small mass difference, um, M21, right, is measured absolutely from solar neutrino oscillations. And your large mass difference, um, which is, you know, M13 or 23, or an admixture of both of them, is measured from atmospheric neutrino oscillations but we do not know the absolute scale of this. And this leads to two possible hierarchies of the masses. You have your normal hierarchy, where your third mass state is heavier than the second, which is heavier than the first, or your so-called inverted hierarchy, where your mass state two is heavier than one by a small amount, and these are heavier than mass state three. And there's also the absolute normalization of 
the mass of this lighter state, right? You can move these up and down. So we'd like to measure that. Okay, so the proposed solution here is because um, over Earth baselines, right, it turns out, and once Dia Bay and others had measured the mixing angle for sine squared theta 1 thi, right, which is about 0 0.022 or thereabouts, it, this, this was the last good measurement of the, uh, um, of the mixing angles. And it meant that over Earth baselines, you're going to get the mass dependent effects on the hier hierarchy. Well, sorry, the mass, the mass dependent effects on oscillations will be different for the different hierarchies. I have no idea what I meant by just writing energy here, right? That must have been some typo. So, okay, here we have oscillograms. This shows as a function of energy and a cosine of your zenith angle, right? So zero is horizon, one is through the core, and here we have energy in GeV. So we see from about two to 100 GeV in these plots, right? That you get different oscillation probabilities. This is the chance of a uh, muon neutrino remaining a muon neutrino at your detector. Okay. Now, to measure the difference between these two plots typically requires a detector of megaton size, right? So what you want to do is measure the probability of uh, new mu to new mu or new mu to new E, compare it to expectations and then determine your hierarchy. So that's the basic idea. However, the signature is a bit more difficult than that, right? So what you want to do is look for a relative um, surplus of depth of electron and muon neutrinos, right? You can measure this with some as asymmetry. So the number you would expect under the inverted hierarchy minus the number you'd expect under the normal hierarchy divided, for instance, by the number you expected by the normal hierarchy. And in a perfect resolution detector, you will get a diagram like this. So the first thing I want to say about this color coding is that this is a miserable lie, right? You see that you quickly change from yellow to blue at zero, but there's almost no difference here. Whereas you have this much darker blue region has a very large difference compared to this lighter blue region, right? So first note that. Next, we do not have perfect detectors. Um, and even if you had a perfect detector, you're, limit, you're limited by the stochastic fluctuations of the physics itself. And so you take a beautiful diagram like this, and this is what the relative um, excess or deficit might look like once you have, say, 25% energy resolution and some approximate angular resolution. And you see that your signature is showing up. Well, here, this, in this case, right, this is due to tau appearance. This is where um, the new mu, the predominantly new mu from the atmosphere oscillate into new tau. So this is the cause of this signature here. Um, but you see you get your main signature is in the sort of 10 GeV and down range. So you want to build a detector that's sensitive to this range, make this measurement with as high a precision as possible, um, and resolve your hierarchy and other neutrino mixing parameters. All right. So these are the remaining questions in this range, right? So what's a neutrino mass hierarchy and what, you know, what's a CP violating, violating phase? Can we further pin down the mixing angles, right? But also neutrinos are a nice place to search for beyond the standard model physics, right? Because uh, neutrino mass masses are unexplained in the standard model and plenty of beyond the standard model physics and, you know, might predict, for instance, um, a supersymmetric partner um, of the neutrino, right, a sterile neutrino, there might be a fourth neutrino flavor. So it's worthwhile looking for um, deviations from expectations in this range. So this leads us to the idea of KM3Net, right? So first of all, all these people are interested in these problems. This is the KM3Net collaboration map. You'll see it's a predominantly European collaboration, right? But we have Africa, Australia. So this is Curtin University here and Western Sydney University is Sydney's contribution, South Africa, um, and I think this is Peru, please tell me if um, I'm wrong, um, from South America, Joy. So it's expanding um, outside of Europe. Now, if you want to study both this high energy astrophysics and lower energy um, oscillations, you can't, it's difficult to build the same detector to do that, right? So what you need is one detector that's optimized for higher energies, and one with a density that's optimized at lower energies. And these detectors are called ARCA and ORCA. ARCA, astrophysical research with cosmics in the abyss. ORCA, oscillation research with cosmics in the abyss. The, um, 
the history, by the way, of this is that the ice cube infill to study oscillation research was called Pingu. And so we figure that, you know, Orca uh, was a similar aquatic uh, name. So this was originally detailed in the KN3 net letter of intent, um, which was published in 2016. And I'll say right now, I was very, very glad to get that paper out of the way because working towards it was a fun and character building experience. I'll say no more. Okay, so what's ARCA going to look like? So it turns out that it's difficult to deploy um, one kilometer cubed on the seabed in one single block. So ARC is divided into two blocks or um, each block, right? Here's two blocks, consists of 115 detection units or strings, right? And they're spaced by about 90 meters in horizontal spacing. Each of these detection units, it's a line anchored to the sea floor with concrete. It's going to have a sensitive length of 612 meters with 36 meter spacing between the modules. Um, and then, you know, kept upright by a positive buoyancy boys at the top. Each of these optical modules is going to contain, um, is that 31 photomultiplier tubes? So that's a lot of PMTs. And the total volume here will be only slightly larger than ice cube, right? About 1.2 cubic kilometers. And the site is um, about 100 kilometers off Sicily, right? At 3.5 kilometer depth. And there'll be an electro optical cable to the shore station at Capa Passero where all the data acquisition lives. That's ARCA. ORCA, which is targeting the sort of, well, I say 3 GV-ish to 100 GV range. It's going to be essentially one block. This is also going to consist of 115 lines. But first of all, each of these lines will have the same number of optical modules, but only of 150 meters length, right? So these are going to be separated by about nine meters spacing between them. And there's only going to be 20 meters of horizontal spacing because you're looking at lower energies. So you need a much um, denser array to st you know, study these things because there's much less light. And this is going to be deployed um, off the southern coast of France, quite close to where the current Antares detector is at a depth of about 2.5 kilometers. So these are the two, um, two detectors. So the basic detection method, um, to go back to this, is that you don't detect the, the neutrinos themselves because they barely do a damn thing. When they do interact, it's generally deep in elastic scattering interactions. So you have a neutral current where you interact with a Z, you interact with a nucleus and produce a hadronic cascade, or you have a charge current where you exchange a W, you get an outgoing lepton that does various things depending on if it's an electron, muon, or tau, and also a hadronic cascade. So you get a bunch of relativistic charge secondaries. These produce, Cher produce Cherenkov radiation, which is you know, the EM analogy of a sonic boom. Right. Um, I have actually, I can verify it exists because I've had the pleasure of looking into a nuclear reactor and cooling tank and seeing a lovely blue glow from there. Um, so, yep, it's a real thing. I don't know if any of you have had that uh, lovely experience. Okay, so I've talked about the science, but what really unites KM3Net and makes it possible is the technology. So, first of all, you want to detect Cherenkov radiation in water. So you need to have something that's sensitive to blue light. And the PMTs we're using are these Hamamatsu R121902 uh, PMTs, right? So they're three inch diameter um, PMTs. Um, sensitive, this is their um, response. So you see how they're quite sensitive to the blue and near UV part of the spectrum. And KM3Net's gonna be using almost 200,000 of these things, right? So we're keeping Hamamatsu in business. Um, and it's quite nice because uh, seawater is fairly transparent at blue wavelengths, right? That's why people um, say the deep blue sea and, the, and not the deep red sea. So one thing we want to do is characterize these things. And so there's been a lot, a lot of work going into understanding the response of these PMTs. And essentially the way we want to run them is in a, um, is in a triggered mode where you're measuring the voltage produced by these things. Here's the ADC channel. This is the distribution of your dark counts right, there's your dark voltage, and here is your response to a single photoelectron, right, so this is what we want to detect, so we can quite clearly place a threshold on the voltage there, and then trigger whenever the voltage exceeds this limit, um, and that's almost always going to be a real um, photon signal, right, very rarely a dark count. So how do we put them in a digital optical module? Well, this is the most beautiful thing of the whole detector, right, you squeeze 31 of these three inch PMTs, 
into one of these glass spheres with about a, approximately 17 inch diameter. Now, one of the really nice things about this is it gives you essentially four pi steradian coverage, right? You have a slightly reduced sensitivity upwards. So if you compare this to the Antares, so the Antares was a previous detector, and you had on each Antares story, you had three, PM, three modules with one PMT each, and they were 10 inch PMTs. So the total effective area of each Antares story was about the same as the total effective area of one came three net dog. First of all, you see that this is a much simpler structure than that. So it makes it easy to deploy. And deploying these things is a challenge, right? You've got to get them on the seabed. Next, here we have as a function of the cosine angle, the total effective area, right? This is what it was for an entire story. And you see it changes quite a lot um, as a function of your zenith angle, right? So this is minus one here is directly up and this is directly down. KM3 net, yes, it varies, but not by so much. So you get good coverage. The other nice thing about seawater is that um, it doesn't scatter your signal very much. So the, if a PMT is facing towards a high energy muon track, you get this very nice sig um, signature with a half width of order a couple of nanoseconds, right? So, this, so you can ver get this very clean type signature and you only get this scattered tail um, at around a few percent of the um, initial signature. But the PMTs that are facing away see almost nothing. So by comparing the signals on the different PMTs in one module, you get extremely good um, directional resolution, right? And you already get very good timing resolution. Um, and this is just to illustrate the background rate um, compared to this sort of situation of a muon at characteristically 50 meters offset. Okay, we've got to build these things and we've got to build a lot of them. So this is uh, some recent pictures from the labs of assembly. Um, many of these labs shut down temporarily um, due to COVID-19 or only just reopening. So you want to assemble these DOMs. You've got to test the PMTs first. Then you've got to put them um, into a 3D printed mounting and connect the hemispheres. And you really want to make sure those hemispheres are connected. One of our early DOMs failed because a human hair accidentally got in between the two glass spheres. And when you put one of these things under what must be about uh, 250 atmospheres of pressure, one human hair in between this glass is going to cause seawater leakage, which destroys the dome, right? So we can build these things at a current capacity over seven different sites, about three domes a day, which amounts to 60 detection units a year, right? And this is going at a good capacity. So this is all we need for our um, final construction date, where we hope that KM3 net will be complete um, by about 2026. However, once you've got a whole bunch of these um, DOMs, you've got to put them together into, into a detection unit. And you want to make sure that all your electronics are um, nicely calibrated. So you do this on a test bench prior to deployment. So here we have um, 18 DOMs on a test bench being calibrated prior to, prior to deployment, right? And we've got five sites that are doing this, although there's two main sites and three of them are ramping up. Um, and this is one of our main challenges because this is just a difficult procedure to get everything shipped, put together, and um, all the DOMs uh, integrated into a detection unit. And then you wrap one of those detection units up into one of these um, deployment, deployment vehicles and you push it off the back of a ship. Um, it's a gravity guided process, the deployment. So you do lower it down and then it just drops. And that gives you um, of order a few meters accuracy on the sea floor. So you clearly want to do this when there's nice weather conditions, right? This is in the Mediterranean and you see there aren't big waves here. Once this is um, sitting on the bottom, you have an acoustic release. This thing unravels and um, the buoyancy, um, you leave the concrete base on the sea floor. The buoyancy lets it unravel. Um, and these deployment vehicles are then recovered. They come up and bob on the sea surface. You then use a remotely operated vehicle to do your undersea cable connections. So that's how it's being constructed. I would love to talk a little bit longer now about how beautiful these things are to calibrate. Um, because of time constraints, I'm not going to talk uh, for too long, but I want to point out um, both one of the good and bad things about water. So one of the initial bad things is you say, oh, water's full of um, potassium-40, right? In seawater, it's salt. Um, and this has a natural radioactive decay to uh, cadmium. Now, 
all the photons from this radioactive decay give you something of about a five kilohertz, six kilohertz rate in the PMTs, right? So it gives you a background rate of about five kilohertz. Now, you can filter this quite easily on shore with your data acquisition, right? Because this is a random background. So the cost of this is that you have to spend money on more CPUs um, at your data acquisition. But this gives you a beautiful self-calibration mechanism, which is always on. And the nice part about it is that it's actually very easy in a standard measurement to measure how much salt there is in the seawater, right? It varies, right? You get variations in salt content with the water and you monitor that, but it's a beautiful calibration signal. So here's an example of the coincidence. So what you do is you get a baseline of single photons, but when you get a double or even threefold coincidence, you can measure the time offset of that coincidence between any two PMTs and the, it gives you a time offset from the center. The area gives you a total efficiency of, a two PM, of the two PMTs and the spread gives you the single photon response, right, of the system. So you can monitor this um, with time. It lets you calibrate your PMTs and you get a beautiful, um, beautiful cell count signature. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'll skip this part. This is just an example of the calibration. Um, what I want to say is that the green line is after calibration and it compares beautifully um, with your uh, atmospheric Monte Carlo simulation. And here's an example of the depth of the detectors, right? These are ORCA detectors around, um, you know, a bit above two and a half kilometers. These are ARCA detectors at um, a bit above three and a half kilometers depth. And here's the rate of um, hits that we get due to primarily downgoing atmospheric muons. And you see in blue, pre-calibration, there's a bunch of scatter going on, right? You just get different PMT responses. However, when you correct this using this calibration signature, you get, sure, there's some differences, but to first order, you um, completely correct for all the scatter. And you can see that this gives you beautiful long-term stability in your calibration, right? So you see here, this is um, the measured efficiency compared to the median efficiency subtracted 1%, right? So the small increments here are plus or minus 1% change in efficiency. And you see that you get of order 0.1 to 0.2% um, efficiency stability as a function of time, which is just magnificent um, in your detector. The slight changes you see here, in particular at the ARCA site, um, are due to you get slight amounts of sediment build up that then get washed away by an increase in the current. Um, and you also get PMT settling in effect, effects, right? If you have a power interruption, you turn it back on, the PMTs recover a little bit. So I wanted to talk about this because the construction of this DOM means that we can self calibrate beautifully. And that's gonna become extremely important, especially when it, we start talking about neutrino hierarchy measurements. So, this thing's actually working. Here we have a little movie of a reconstructed event. We didn't actually see the whale or the dolphin. We didn't put that in. This is an event measured at the Orca site, right? And here we have the reconstructed um, upgoing muon from a neutrino that's interacted beneath the detector. And these are the hits we saw on the DOMs, right? So the current status is that Arca had the first uh, string deployed in 2015. Um, two strings were operational in 2019, but we then had to refurbish the seafloor systems and we're just restarting, right? But the goal is to have two lots of 115 DUs deployed by 2026. Orca, we now have six strings operating and the goal is to get a, all 115 deployed by 2024. So that's the current status and expectations. All right, there's the event again. Let me see if I can skip to the next slide. All right, the first results here are just to check that everything's working as expected, an absolute measurement of the um, atmospheric muon flux. So what we have here, here's measurements from, KM, um, from KM3Net. This is Orca here and Arca here. And the systematic range uh, is the sort of purple. Old Antares measurements, which is from the previous neutrino telescope in the Mediterranean, in blue, system, together with systematics. And then we have model predictions from the atmospheric neutrino flux together with systematics. And you see things are in beautiful agreement, right? So we understand already from this of order, what is it? I guess it's about 5% instrument. Um, things are operating exactly as we expect, right? 
But how good do we expect the instrument to actually be? So, well, when we want to reconstruct um, high energy astrophysics events, there's to first order two kinds of events. There's the track channel, and this is dominated by new mu charge current events that produce an energetic muon, and that muon can travel for a large distance through seawater, right? Um, tens of kilometers. This gives you most of these events, but you have more exotic channels that can then produce a through going muon with these approximate ratios. So if you see a through going muon, it, you better restrict yourselves to upcoming events because most of the through going muons from down going events are uh, direct muons from extensive air showers in the atmosphere. So you have to restrict yourself primarily to upcoming events. So you've got two pi resolution, but you get really nice angular resolution on these through going tracks um, and you get a good effective area even if your energy resolution isn't so good. So when you do that, here is the reconstructed, here's a sort of simulated event that might look like the K3Net of an upgoing event. Here we have your estimated angular resolution. Here's the energy. Now there's a, because you're measuring the muon direction, you have a fundamental limit on your primary neutrino direction from the interaction kinematics, which is the red line. In black, we have the median direction resolution um, to these neutrinos from KM3Net. And we see that at the sort of characteristic 10 TeV of galactic sources, we get about 0.2 degrees resolution. And at above 100 TeV, we get less, we get a resolution that's better than 0.1 degrees, right? However, when you start trying to reconstruct the energy of these things, it's a very stochastic limited process. So you get something like about um, a quarter of log 10 E in energy reconstruction, right? Simply because the amount of energy the neutrino gives to the muon, the amount of energy the mu muon loses before it gets to your detector, and the amount of energy the muon deposits in your detector all impose an intrinsic limit on what your detector can actually see. However, there's also these cascade or shower event events, and these will be produced by neutrinos of any variety, right? Either charge current or neutral current events. Now these are this kind, and these have to occur inside your detector, right? Because there's no large range outgoing um, particle from this. However, it's a very clean signature, right? Because you have nothing, 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 nothing. Then all of a sudden in the middle of your detector, it's a neutrino, right? So you can see everything over four pi and you have pretty good energy resolution, right? Because um, you capture sort of all the energy that's given to these particles is deposited in your detector. Your directional resolution might not be so good. And you also have increased sensitivity to electron neutrinos because the electron as well as the hadronic products all create a fairly localized cascade. So this is our expected resolution. You essentially, what you're essentially doing is fitting a probability of detecting an event as a function of the direction with respect to the Cherenkov angle, which is here, and whether or not you're facing towards or away from the event with your PMT. So this is an, you're, you're, pro, you're basically fitting this to your light signature. If you then try to measure your energy resolution, um, here you have your reconstructed energy over the deposited energy, and you get about 5% energy resolution, right? On the deposited energy in your detector. In terms of your angular resolution, well, on the one hand, you can say it's worse, and it definitely is worse than a through going muon. It's about 1.5 degree uh, resolution medium right, over this sort of 100 TeV to PeV range. However, we should also um, point out that the current high energy ice cube events have angular resolutions up here, right? The best ones they get is about seven degrees, typically about 15 degrees. So this is one of the beautiful things about water, you get a really nice angular reconstruction. So why do we care about angular resolution? Well, I mentioned this event earlier. So this is this high energy through going uh, muon track event. And this was the 50% ice cube resolution. Here is what um, ARCA would have been able to see, right? So you can compare the sort of estimated green circle to um, the reconstructed error of ice cube here. And the universe is full of things. So if you see an interesting event and you look back and you say, well, what, what could have produced it? Then if you've got a poor uh, direction re resolution, the answer is gonna be, well, there's something there, but what does that mean? And similarly, the neutrino event, uh, the flare from TXS 0506 plus 056 
was essentially 13 plus or minus um, five excess events. For ARCA, that would have been 13 plus or minus one excess events, right? So you clearly have extra resolving power. How would you then expect this to perform compared to generic sources? Well, it, this is a bit of an odd comparison because you have to assume some time for IceCube, but clearly IceCube will be operating for more than seven years by the time ARC is finished. But you see that generally um, it's really filling in this gap um, to the Southern Hemisphere. And this is my main reason for caring about this, right? Australia's in the Southern Hemisphere and our telescopes view Southern Hemisphere sources and so ARCA is going to be, and KM3 and it is primarily sensitive to the southern sky. Okay, if you want to start looking for galactic sources, this, by the way, was assuming a generic e to the minus two source with no cutoff, right? So a very broad spectrum. We know that galactic um, sites of hadronic acceleration are not um, emitting gamma rays at petaelectron volts, right? When people perform models of different sources, so Vela Junior, Vela X, RX, J1713, the Galactic Center, other sources, right? These tend to be in the southern sky because that's where most of the galaxy is. And they also tend to have cutoffs around the 10 TV mark, right? Now, this is clearly model dependent, but you say the first order, the flux starts decreasing above 10 uh, TV. So what's the sensitivity to these sources? Well, these are our predictions. So this is the estimated time it would take to make a three sigma discovery of these sources. And you see that for some of the models and with some of the sources, right, Vela Junior, RXJ1713, we might be able to get a three sigma discovery of these sources within about five or six years, right? Again, that might, that's model dependent, right? But we have you know, an optimistic reason to believe that we might be able to see these things. However, the long-term plan of KM3Net is to extend ARC to six blocks so we can really start probing a much larger range of galactic hadronic accelerators. So my first um, lot of unsolicited comments, I think, please ask me about these. I want to get onto ORCA, but these comments are essentially saying, um, don't believe these previous estimates, they're too simplistic. Right, okay. And as far as the high energy astrophysics, there's a whole bunch of things that I haven't discussed here. One thing I do want to um, highlight to this group is in particular the use for indirect dark matter searches and searching for say exotic physics, right? Nuclearites, monopoles, Lorentz invariance violation. Um, but if you want to ask me about the kind of studies that you can do with the earth and sea sciences and how we're tracking whales, then please go ahead because that's also quite interesting. So now in the remaining time, let's talk about the neutrino mass hierarchy in the fundamental physics, right, ORCA. So this is really where the particle physics community gets interested and the astrophysicists sort of tune out. So how do we want to measure the neutrino mass hierarchy? So previously, we talked about oscillograms, right? The idea of a new mu staying as a new mu um, as a function of its zenith angle and its energy. So clearly, you want to measure at any given event the energy and the zenith angle and see if it's a, what the interaction type is. Is it a new mu or not? However, what you're really doing is measuring do we see a significant muon or not, right? So you could easily have a new mu with a low energy muon that you just can't resolve, right? And it's also possible to have a new E charge current event with a single high energy electron that, that comes out of it that might try to impersonate um, an outgoing muon, right? So these raw oscillograms end up being quite useless for trying to understand where your sensitivity is. One of the issues is that this is at low energies where you get large fluctuations in the intrinsic light yield, right? And there's fundamental fluctuations in the light pattern. So what I um, show here is a simulation of a single event of, oh, I should remember the energy. Um, it's probably around 10 GeV, I guess. And this pattern on grayscale is all the photons, um, the direct photons that would be measured um, if you measured like every single photon, right? And you clearly see that in, I think in green here, we have the original direction of the neutrino. I think from memory in black is what you get if you measure every single photon, right? So if you had a perfect detector that measured every single photon, you would still get some intrinsic offset. 
However, you don't measure every single photon, you measure a fraction of them. And that's, and these blue triangles are one particular sample of the photons that would be measured by Orca. And you clearly see that you, if you try to reconstruct perfect Cherenkov cones out of these blue points, it's difficult, right? And if you then took the average position, the average direction of these photons, you would get this um, red diamond, right? So you get some intrinsic limitations to what you can do. And furthermore, for high energies, we've been talking about this through going track versus cascade events, right? But at these low energies, muons are only traveling four meters per giga electron volt, right? And you compare that to the radiation length in water of a, you know, a reasonable fraction of a meter. And it means that it can become hard to distinguish between these two event classifications. The other issue is you have a whole lot of systematics because it turns out that GB scale physics is about the worst scale to be doing estimates on. Right? And there's a few reasons for this. First of all, at high energies, we've been talking about deep and elastic scattering. But if this is neutrino energy in GV here, right? And this is the cross section for various processes. You see deep and elastic scattering only becomes dominant around 100 giga electron volts. Below there, you have different resonances and also quasi elastic scattering, right? Where it's interacting with the nucleus as a whole and, and you have um, inducing resonances um, and excited states of a nucleus. So that's one complication. Another problem is that the scatter, these interactions are not really very deep um, in the one to 10 GeV range. They're quite shallow because your interaction energy is not completely dominant over the binding energies and the energies of the partons and nucleons that you're interacting with. So there's a whole bunch of codes and the standard code we, need, we use to do this is Genie. There's another one called Gibu that we're experimenting with but these produce different predictions for the outgoing particles, right? Furthermore, once you've got some outgoing particles of these interactions, you need to propagate them to determine their light yield. The standard um, propagators are Fluker, which has an incorrect multiplicity for hadronic products, and Geisha, which does not conserve energy, right? So there's fundamental systematics in the way the physics behaves here that we have to be very careful of because the measurement is sensitive to this. So you need to fit several systematics for this, but this is really why I talk so much about the calibration, right? Where we care about these systematics, we can't, we're trying to control them, but we don't have to care very much about the systematics of our detector because we understand it beautifully. So here's some first results from, um, we've had about a third of a year of data with 5% of ORCA. Now look, we detect neutrino oscillations. Well, yes, of course neutrinos oscillate, right? Here we have the reconstructed zenith angle, data in black, and we have um, atmospheric neutrinos without oscillations and atmospheric neutrinos with oscillations. And look, we get consistency with the atmospheric neutrinos with oscillations. Not a beautiful scientific result because we know they already oscillate, but we get what we expect, right? And this is already a positive sign. Now, when it comes to the classification and distinguishing between um, electron neutrino and muon neutrino events, we really want to go to deep learning here, right? We can't do a nice analytic reconstruction like we can with ARCA. There's a bunch of different methods being tested. Um, so this is one particular machine learning method, the deep learning. Um, and what we're showing here is the fraction of events that are classified as a track event as a function of the energy for new mu CC events, new E CC events, and new E NC events, right? And you see at low energies, it becomes quite, you know, you get quite a significant contamination um, from these two categories, right? So of order 20% of your events that you think are track-like in a sub five GeV range are gonna be new E, and new, new e events of one variety or another, right? And you can only get good differentiation at higher energies. Um, so it's tough, right? It's a difficult thing to do. Um, Furthermore, I talked earlier about beautiful angular resolution and energy resolution. Well, here we give the median relative energy error, right? So this is 10% energy error. This is 20% energy error. And this is with two different energy reconstruction methods, right? Oh, I forget which kind of event this was actually. I think this is new ECC events um, from memory. Yes, it is new ECC. Good, I put it there. Um, and when you do an angular resolute reconstruction at 10 GeV, you're getting right 0.2 of a radian, right? It's a 10 degree space angle error. 
although we should emphasize it's actually your zenith angle error that, care, that you care about. So, okay, it's difficult, but you know, is it good enough? So here's our current, our most current estimates for the ability of ORCA to resolve the neutrino mass ordering. So first of all, your ability to resolve the neutrino mass ordering depends on what the truth is, right? And it's dependent upon theta two, three. So what we have here, this is your sensitivity in sigma after, th after a simulated three years of study. And here's ORCA sensitivity as a function of theta two, three. And you see that we expect to get above three sigma and potentially above five sigma within three years. Right? And you can compare that to, for instance, Juno, um, which is the uh, Chinese um, reactor oscillation experiment, um, which will get of order two and a bit sigma, right? After a similar, you know, after using eight cores for a similar amount of time. However, you know, no detector is an island. And actually by combining the two measurements, because they have different sensitivities and different uh, systematics, we actually expect to get a really strong detection of, for instance, the, assuming the normal ordering is the truth or equivalent in detecting the inverted hierarchy, right? Um, when we combine this two data set. So yes, ORCA is expected to be able to resolve the neutrino mass ordering in of order three years. We're somewhere between, you know, maybe 2.5 or three sigma to five sigma significance on its own. And it can also restrain, uh, constrain, you know, delta m squared three two, sine squared uh, three two, this is various different experiments with air constraints in this space. Um, ORCA after, um, at the moment, right, with our current estimates, these are the constraints um, with our current detector, right, current sensitivity. However, after three years with a full detector, this is, these are our expected constraints. So compared to current limits, this will be generating new limits on these parameters. You can also say, okay, what about a fourth neutrino flavor? I'm basically out of time. So this is, you know, beyond standard model physics, but clearly you want to be looking for new signatures of, let's say, um, mixing in theta two, an imaginary theta two, four, um, or uh, as a function of um, three, four and two, four mixing, right? And these are the kind of limits that you might get from ORCA after three years compared to existing limits from um, other astrophysical neutrino detectors. But keep in mind, I have not plotted what the limits are from dedicated beamline and reactor experiments on this plot. Okay, so how do I essentially see, a, this is my second to last slide. So how do I essentially see Australia's role in this? So first of all, we have people here who do, you know, theoretical physics, right? Um, and if we can get the specific expectations for beyond the standard model oscillations, that's gonna be much, much more useful as a target search for ORCA than just something unusual. Right. Also, if we can get um, any improvement in the statistical methods, ORCA sensitivity estimates are currently limited by the complexity of the statistics. Right. It's actually very computationally intense and difficult to do these estimates of ORCA sensitivity. Um, so investigating a new stats method there is important. As far as high energy astrophysics, right, we want to better understand galactic accelerators, right? And clearly there's a role for Australia here. We've already have MWA and MOPRA in particular making studies of these um, sources, but any multi-messenger leaks, right? Australia's involved in CTA, Ice Cube, is radio, optical, X-ray groups, maybe gravitational waves. Anybody and everybody is looking for counterparts to GW events, so why not in neutrinos? Um, and also Blazar VLBI, right? If you want to look at Blazars in radio, and VLBI is a great way to do it, and Australia is the only home of Southern Hemisphere VL VLBI networks. Another axis that I haven't talked about is in diversity initiatives, right? So these kind of things are now becoming mandatory for EU funded projects. And Australia's generally got a bit of a head start in this, right? E.g. through the Pleiades Awards. Now, so for instance, I'm one of uh, two members for KM3Net's um, Equality, Diversity um, and Inclusion Committee, right? So in help to draft things like the Code of Behaviour and Ethical Conduct. We can also look on the environment axis. And regardless of your opinion of global warming, maybe you think it's a wonderful thing and we should melt the damn ice poles because you just don't like ice and hate penguins. Sure. But from a competitive advantage of Australia in research, we have a very strong incentive to encourage online meetings, right? Because if we want to be part of big international collaborations, the tyranny of distance for Australia is terrible. And we want to encourage um, these meetings to be online to aid our participation. Right? So, in conclusion, KM3Net, ARCA and ORCA 
high energy astrophysics and neutrino oscillations in the mice hierarchy. These are quite different science goals, but they're linked by a common and beautiful technology, right? Which is the fundamental reason why the way the one collaboration. Now, currently under construction, it's being built. Um, I haven't said how much is funded. I think it's about 40% at the moment. Um, and we're on track for a 2026 completion. There were some initial setbacks with the undersea infrastructure that have now been overcome. Uh, but the preliminary results show that everything is under control and well understood. My personal motivation, motivation for involvement is that, well, we, I want to build up um, involvement in KM3 net now in order to prepare for the new neutrino astronomy um, in the near future, because this is going to go from a weird particle physics experiment to a new way of observing the universe. So thank you very much for indulging me. I'll pretend the extra seven minutes comes out of the uh, lag in the start time and open it up for questions now. So thanks very much. So thank you very much, Glancy, for a very good overview of KM3 Net. So we have time for questions. Who wants to go first? Maybe I start to set it off, start us off. Um, okay, so we had, so you showed those uh, projections for the mass hierarchy measurement. Yes. Um, what's that with the full detector? So if you say basically three years, does that basically mean it's for the full completed detector or yep. does it include that? Yeah, so that estimate is simply for the full completed detector after three years. So that would effectively be 20, end of 2027 mm -hmm. uh, with the current progression. Okay, um, and and we are on six years from then. Oh yeah, wait a sec. That's a good point. Okay, sorry, this one might be... Ah. I apologize, this is three years and this might be six years. Oh, I should double check that. Um, yeah. No, yes. I, I'm just curious because, um, um, of course, in the US, they will be building Tune and then Japan will be building Hyper-K, mm -hmm. which will also measure the mass hierarchy. Um, yeah, exactly. And of course, um, Orca is already being constructed. That has a head start as such. I, I'm just interested in what's the, how, how well, what's the timeline kind of? Can you compete with them when they start, yes. before they start? So the problem, so first of all, um, there were some really nice plots generated by independent people. So if someone from within one of these collaborations generates a timeline, then they're always going to get yelled at by everybody from the other collaborations because, you know, you didn't account for this and all that sort of thing. There were some nice plots that I don't have access, well, I do have access to that showed sensitivity versus time, including the start date for about 10 different projects. Mm -hmm. And these were made about five years ago or so, around 2015, mm -hmm. before these projects started being constructed. Since then, every project has hit the realities of construction. So I can tell you how much ORCA has been delayed compared to the original estimates. I have no idea what the detailed figures are for June and the other experiments, which means that these initial estimates, which had ORCA beginning in 2020 and June beginning in 2022 or something like that are completely out the window and I haven't seen a good comparison since then. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. but we're quite aware of that and the main reason why we're trying to construct ORCA first is because of this timeline competitiveness. Yeah, exactly. There's the run yep. for who can get it first. It's a right. Who yep. can make the three stigma yep. measurement yep. first. We want to win it, damn it. That's uh, that's clear. Um, other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. So um, I I, know some, I read somewhere that sharks like to bite on fiber optic cables. So like. Is there any danger of a, a rogue shark coming in and biting half the detector off or at least break the string somehow? Oh, yes. So there's two answers to your question. One is, is there a danger of a shark doing it? And then there's another danger of, does it happen? So to save you having to conduct a very messy experiment, if you take a shark to 2.5 kilometers depth, it is not a shark anymore. Um, the deepest diving um, animals that we detect are sperm whales, which get down to something ridiculous like one and a half kilometers um, to hunt deep sea squid. But at these depths, you don't have sizable animals. There are some very deep sea fish, but they're relatively small. So there's no danger of creatures biting the cables. The main danger is that the Mediterranean is very polluted, um, which is a real tragedy. And you have cables that get snagged on fishing lines. So um, we actually had a case where um, 
one of our cable, the main electro optical cable from our shore station to the detector got snagged with a fishing line that caused a rupture in the cable and we had to repair it. Um, and there's essentially no way to control for that except to fix it and redeploy the cable. And that is a real and genuine danger. Um, now, once the cables are deployed though, you're safe, right? They're just sitting on the seabed and um, a rogue fishing line isn't going to um, move them, right? It's, it's at the deployment stage. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, I've completely slipped my mind um, how deep this thing was put on the... Yes, exactly. Um, Bruce, you had a question. So, uh, Clancy, could you go back one or two slides to when you were talking about the deep learning? Yeah, that will do, that one. Yep. Um, now, I wasn't sure if I just zoned out when you made some appropriate comment or whether I was misreading this. So, if I look on the right-hand plot, yep. um, you've got curves for zenith angle and for space angle. Yep. Um, so the question is, are you estimating only the zenith angle or are you estimating the full space angle? Is that the point? Yes. Yeah, so, so what fundamentally matters in this measurement is the zenith, is the zenith angle, yeah. right? You could be 180 degrees off in your azimuthal direction, but your path length through the earth is to first order and many orders. So, okay, yes, if that's the, if that's the question you're trying to, to determine, then, yep. then yes. So did I understand then from the curves that the, the deep learning, the attempts at using deep learning for this are still in their infancy? Yes. Actually, when I say the standard result here is also um, has machine learning techniques involved um it's just not a deep learning algorithm but yes you're right this is the first you know full and you know application of deep learning that takes it right through to an event right. so the standard is some combination of likelihood ratios neural yep. nets yep exactly um, boosted decision yep. trees or something like yeah, that. i can't remember if it's a boosted random, decision tree, random decision forest or not but it's a combination so the basic procedure and standard is that there's some low level reconstructions and then you apply um, a, uh, I can't remember if it's a boosted decision tree or random decision forest. Right, but it, yeah, it, it's, it, it's an MVA method, but it's not deep. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. um, while I'm on, I might ask another question if I may about the collaboration. Um, so, the non-standard neutrino properties uh, and other sort of fundamental physics interest and the astrophysical questions are uh, in many departments sit in very different parts of the building or aren't even in the same building at all. Yes. Um, now, I mean, in a large particle physics collaboration, of course, there are different there are different communities of interest and some of them are kind of cul-de-sac-y, but I have a feeling for how that works. Um, I have very little feeling for how a collaboration that's got both fundamental particle properties people and distant, astro distant astronomical object guys working together. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, actually, this is a really interesting point. Um, and how to actually get a collaboration working and, um, you know, and functioning is probably the most important part of this. So first, let me say that CAM3Net is primarily an experimental collaboration. So to first order, CAM3Net doesn't have any astrophysicists, doesn't have any, um, you know, particle theoreticians, and it's composed only of experimentalists, right? If you want to get a first order approximation. Um, and that's really why the collaboration exists as a single collaboration. Um, it's because it's the common technology that's being used, the common simulation packages and analysis techniques. Um, so that's really what binds things together. And this also means 
that all the politics um, really went on uh, when it came to the original site decision. So historically, um, around the early 2000s, there was a Greek project, an Italian project, and a French project, which turned into Antares, that were completely independent projects, and they all aimed to have a cubic kilometer size instrument. And then it became quickly apparent to everyone that it was nonsensical to have three separate groups try to do the same thing in the Mediterranean. And so there was quite some time of, you know, mashing these three groups together into a coherent whole. Um, and there the, um, the difficulty was simply having, um, you know, things like site decisions, for instance. Um, and in that sense, having the possibility of ORCA come along, um, so there's a couple of things that smooth it over and they're practical considerations. One, having ORCA exist, right? Having a different science goal for a denser detector means that you want to have different detection blocks. And so it means that if you've got one site and, an, and another site and they're both saying, we both want to host the detector, well, one site has one and one site has the other, right? And that neatly solves the problem. Um, so that was, uh, sort of, I guess, where most of the politics began and ended. Um, regarding your original question about the astrophysics and the fundamental um, neutrino physics. So most of the community comes from the particle physics side. Um, when I'm back at, at Curtin, people think of me as a particle physics person. And when I speak to people within KM3Net, people think of me as an astronomer. And I have absolutely no idea who I am. I'm probably halfway in between and maybe neither. Um, so this is why I think that adding these sort of, there's actually a pretty low bar if you come into this collaboration and other similar collaborations um, from an astrophysics point of view, right? I think that um, a small amount of expert expertise there adds a lot. Um, it's pretty similar on the uh, theory side because the history of the collaboration was that it was all originally designed purely around high energy astrophysics. And it was only um, when, oh, I forget which experiment really pinned down theta 13, I had it in my slides, when it became apparent that the value of theta 13 meant that you could do a mass hierarchy measurement um, on earth baselines. Only then did people say, hang on a second. That would, would have been the Chinese reactor experiment, I think. Yeah. Dyer Bay. Yes, sure. Yep. Yes. Yep. At that point, we're like, hang on a second, we can do this measurement. But it meant that there historically were no, you know, new neutrino theory groups um, within within KM3. And there's still very few people who, in fact, I would say that there's, oh, the collaboration's expanding quite rapidly, but I still don't think there's anyone in the collaboration who would say that they're purely a um, neutrino uh, theorist, but I may be wrong because, um, as I said, the I think that answers my question. I mean, yeah. the, the issue is not necessarily having things in house because of course, I mean, you, you publish your results and people can make use of them. Yeah. The, the, the issue is having sufficient competence that you're not at the mercy of the, the cranky views of some particular um, of some particular resourced institutional head whose whose opinions on a on a question to the left of his act, of his own expertise are thirty years out of date. Um, yeah, I think what you're telling me is that you're avoiding that by by having enough people. It's basically an instrumental collaboration, but it's got enough people in it with cross competence that. Well, I, these questions get get addressed. I would argue that we have barely enough, okay. uh, especially when it comes to beyond the standard and model. We would physics. like to recruit some more. Yes, especially when it comes to beyond the standard model physics. Now, essentially, um, when it comes to ARCA, you know, you mentioned the idea of publishing the data, so you can very easily publish a list of high energy events, right, detected by ARCA and say, right, you know, here's the properties of the events, here's their estimated energies, angular resolutions, likelihood of atmospheric background, you know, go your hardest, right? And that's something that's relatively easy to explore. I mean, I say relatively easy, a whole bunch of people misinterpreted Ice Cube's events, but okay. 
that is just not going to be possible with a walker, right? Um, you need to understand the details of the reconstruction of the systematics to a huge degree to do this. And what that means is that there's zero possibility of an outsider being able to take their own, you know, look for their own signature of, um, beyond, you know, non-standard model neutrino oscillations and use that on ORCA data. You have to begin with the primary theoretical calculation of how many neutrinos of which flavor and what kind of interactions you expect to see. So it's more like the particle physics publishing model than it's like a satellite observatory publishing model. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, we do plan on giving um, KM3Net events to be completely public after a certain time frame. I think two years is what we plan on doing. But even then, you know, history suggests that the full amount of information will be difficult to publish and ORCA is, yeah, completely particle physics model. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any last question? No, I think you answered all questions. So let's thank yeah. Nancy once more for very